The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The views expressed in this program are for informational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly in studio today. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, if you have questions on anything that we discuss on today's show, or if you would like more information about investing in ETFs, you can call an ETF store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFs. That's 877-365-3837. Or you can visit us online at ETFstore.com. So today we're going to take a look at how well actively managed mutual funds have been performing. And twice a year, there's a, a rather interesting report that comes out that offers some wonderful data on mutual fund performance. And I think if you're investing in actively managed mutual funds, this report certainly provides some food for thought. But even if you're not, I think there are some worthwhile takeaways here for every investor. So we'll go through some of the highlights from this report in the first part of the show. And then later, we're going to switch gears and talk about an area of investing that's been generating quite a bit of buzz recently, something called Robo advisors. You may have heard of these. These are online investment platforms where instead of working face to face with an investment advisor, everything is done online. And as it turns out, we actually launched our own online investment service last week. It's called iPortfolios. So we'll spend a few minutes explaining what this is and offer a few thoughts on whether a robo advisor may be a good fit for you. We'll close the show today with our usual weekly market update and ETF spotlight. And as always, if you have questions or comments, you can find us on Twitter or you can email us at advice at ETFstore.com. So let's start today by talking mutual fund performance. And as I mentioned, twice a year, something called the SPIVA scorecard is released. Now, SPIVA stands for S&P Dow Jones Indices versus Active. And if you haven't heard of S&P Dow Jones Indices, they're one of the leading index providers and a very well-known investment research firm. And one of the things they do is they put together this report showing how well actively managed mutual funds have performed versus their benchmark indexes. Of course, actively managed mutual funds, we know they try to set out to beat the market or beat these indexes. And they try to do that by selecting the best performing stocks or bonds. So very simply, what S&P Dow Jones Indices does is they try to measure how well mutual funds did at picking these stocks or bonds, and they put together a scorecard. And what I like about this scorecard is it's very straightforward. It's an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between the performance of the mutual funds and their appropriate benchmarks. It also accounts for things like, like funds that have shut down and gone away. You know, kind of really, this is as good of a barometer as any to gauge how well mutual funds have performed. Yeah, Nate, this is a just a fantastic report in like you mentioned, Standard & Poor's, that name, they're an independent research agency. And this semi-annual report that they've been putting out for quite some time has really become well-known and garners quite a bit of attention when it's released. CNBC, Money Magazine, all the large financial news media picks up uh, this report every time, twice a year when it's released. Now, look, as our company name implies... We are big believers in, in low-cost, index-based ETFs to build investment for, portfolios for our clients. But our job as a fiduciary to our clients is to analyze all investments out there objectively, and that includes actively managed mutual funds. So we think this report is, is one of the best independent, objective resources out there regarding the performance of act, actively managed mutual funds, which is why we pay so much attention to it when it comes out. And, and we're not setting out to, to throw stones against active management, but at the same time, the data in this report 
needs to be discussed and understood by investors. Yeah, I also think this data is important to look at because one of the most passionate areas of debate in investing is whether you can outperform the market. And there's certainly a large camp of investors who believe you can, and there's a large camp of investors who believe you can't. And I don't know that this S&P Dow Jones uh, scorecard is going to settle that debate today. But I do think at a minimum, the scorecard shows that outperforming the market is certainly very difficult, especially after you factor in investment costs. So let's just walk through some of the highlights here. Again, this uh, report was released about a week and a half ago. And first of all, I think the headline number from the report was that last year, over 86% of large cap stock mutual fund managers underperformed the S&P 500 index. So the S&P 500 index was up about 13.7% in 2014. So 86% of large cap stock mutual funds return less than that. Now, you know, the, the greater interesting thing about this scorecard is that they don't just provide data from the past year. They also provide data for three, five, and now 10-year periods. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the returns from over the past 10 years, 82% of large cap stock mutual funds have underperformed the S&P 500. So 2014 wasn't an aberration. Uh, over the past 10 years, 80% plus of mutual fund managers have underperformed. Yeah, Nate, it, it doesn't matter almost what what time horizon you're talking about. The one, three, five, or 10 years, the numbers are, are um, really pretty surprisingly consistent. And the reason why we're talking about the S&P 500 to start this conversation off is because that's... That's what most people are, are talking about when they turn on the news at night. And when somebody asks, you know, how did the market do today? It's it's the S&P 500 is, is what matters to most investors in the U.S. So, again, when looking at the performance of mutual funds who use the S&P 500 as their benchmark, 82% underperformed over the last 10 years. That's less than a 1 in 5 chance of picking a fund that simply matches the return of the S&P 500. So let me put that another way. If you simply owned an S&P 500 index ETF and paid four to eight basis points to do so, you'd have outperformed over 82% of the professional mutual fund managers out there in that large cap space. Well, what's interesting is that it's not just large cap U.S. stocks where mutual fund managers have underperformed. If we look at some of the other fund categories in the report, and I'm not going to go through the entire report here. This thing is 27 pages long. Uh, but if we look at a few of the more popular areas that people like to invest in, uh, for example, small cap stocks, well, 88% of small cap stock mutual funds have underperformed over the past 10 years, according to the SPIVA scorecard. Uh, international stock mutual funds, 84% have underperformed over the past 10 years. Emerging market stock funds, almost 90% over the past 10 years. And then if you look at uh, a couple of bond categories, over the past 10 years, 95% plus of government long bond mutual funds have underperformed in 93% of high-yield funds. These are pretty remarkable numbers here. I don't even know where to start with all that data, Nate. I mean, the takeaway to me is the problem of underperforming mutual funds isn't simply limited to the S&P 500 or large-cap U.S. equities. And In fact, all the asset classes you, ju you just mentioned, all of them had worse performance than the mutual fund managers going against the S&P 500 over the past 10 years. And in some of these categories, the odds are 1 in 8 or even 1 in 10 or worse that you can find a mutual fund that outperforms its benchmark. And <laughs> that makes the 1 in 5 odds you get with the S&P 500 almost seem decent. And, you know, kind of we look at this data uh, twice a year when it comes out, and, and we're, we're certainly following this every year. But I, I guess I'm still surprised when I look at the report because one of the things I, I think is very noteworthy is that a common refrain you'll hear from mutual fund advisors or mutual fund companies when they talk about active management is that, yeah, they'll typically agree that beating the benchmark in something like large cap U.S. stocks or the S&P 500, that that can be difficult. But what they'll tell you is that where active management can really add value is in smaller, less efficient markets like small cap stocks or emerging market stocks. But if you look at the data here, the underperformance is actually worse in these categories. The asset class that sticks out to me is high-yield bonds. This this is a category that fits the active management criteria perfectly, right? It's very illiquid. It's not a very transparent market. 
Um, it, it, it's a market that would allow, you know, in theory, a smart manager and his team of analysts to comb through the risky bonds out there and decide which ones to own and which ones to avoid. I mean, on the surface, that makes a lot of sense. But look at the data. It, it simply does not lie. Over the past 10 years, 93% of actively managed mutual funds in the high-yield bond space underperformed their benchmark. I mean, that's simply remarkable. I, I, a bookie would blush if he was providing such lopsided <laughs> odds to, to his gamblers. I mean, it's that's a very one-sided um, bet in terms of who's going to win most of the time, and it's the house. And, Nate, one other important point before we move on. You can you also see active manager proponents say you'll get out performance during periods of extremes, right? In in, in both up markets and in raging bull markets, and and most importantly in in very bad down markets. Well, over the past ten years of this data on on the speed of scorecard, we've seen both one of the worst periods of market performance since the Great Depression occurred in two thousand eight, and we've had a six year bull market. Since the market bottomed out in March of 2009, I mean, it, it's hard to find, you know, more extreme scenarios of, of mar- the market performance than that. And the data we've been discussing has included both the recession of, of 08 and the recovery since then. And again, the significant majority of the funds, the outperformance touted by actively managed mutual funds simply didn't happen during those two periods of extreme market performance. That's a great point. And, you know, I know it sounds like we're sitting here and, and just bashing active management. But, you know, again, what we like to do is take a step back and just look at the data. You know, let's not interject our own thoughts and opinions. Let's look at the black and white data that's out there. And you bring up a good point, Connor, because we talked about looking at some of the less efficient markets, like, you know, perhaps emerging market stocks or high yield bonds, and, and you don't see the outperformance there. You don't see the outperformance in, in the very efficient markets like large cap U.S. stocks. And then, again, to your point, I think looking at market extremes, because that is one of the things you'll hear uh, when there's a, a, a raging bull market or when stocks are, are, are tanking, maybe this is an area where active management can step in and really find the high flyers in that bull market or avoid uh, you know, the falling knife, so to speak, mm-hmm. in a down market, but you don't see that. No, you don't. And, again, the 10-year the, the data that we're looking at, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're talking domestic stocks or international stocks or emerging market bonds or government bonds, corporate bonds. The asset class, it doesn't matter. The The inability of active management to outperform is essentially the same across all of these asset classes. And, and, you know, another issue here, too, is just the consistency of performance. I think regardless of the fund category or whether we have extremes in the market, because you might look at this data and say, well, active managers clearly have a tough time, but there are still 10 to 20% outperforming in any given year. So I'll just pick those managers. But the issue with this is that the managers who outperform one year tend not to outperform the following year. And as a matter of fact, the New York Times, they had a wonderful piece last week titled, How Many Mutual Funds Routinely Route the Market? I tweeted this out, but they looked at the performance of 2,000 862 actively managed U.S. stock mutual funds from 2010 to 2014. And the question they asked was, how many of those funds stayed in the top 25% of performance for the entire period? In other words, they weren't even asking which mutual funds outperformed their benchmarks. They were simply asking which funds stayed in the top 25% of performance compared to their peers Mm -hmm. during this period. And the answer that they came up with in the article was two. Two mutual funds out of 2,862 stayed in the top 25% of performance. That's it. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing stat. That article, and, and we'll we'll get that uh, piece from the New York Times back out on social media again because it's pretty unbelievable. Um, what that tells me is, is this. You simply cannot pick outperforming funds in any given year. The, the, the reality is it's more attributed to randomness and luck than any particular analysis of the funds or managers that you could possibly yeah, do you can't as do an it investor. Consistently. You cannot. And keep in mind, Nate, that we're only talking about a five year period in that article, not ten or twenty years, and just two out of twenty eight hundred plus mutual funds stayed in the top twenty five percent over those five years. I mean to me, 
this stat is almost more compelling than any of the SPIVA data we've been talking about. Yeah, and here's the thing. I, I just mentioned, you know, we're not sitting out here to bludgeon, you know, active managers. And we talked about this before because I think when you look at the poor track record for mutual funds, there's no question. This isn't a case where mutual fund managers aren't talented or they're not smart or even that they don't have a special knack for picking stocks because I think probably many of them do. The problem is, one, the average mutual fund charges a 1.3% fee every year. And so the mutual fund managers have to overcome this fee just to equal the benchmark. In other words, they're starting on average in a 1.3% hole that they have to dig out of, and that's not easy to do. And then two, remember, these managers, they are smart and they are talented and they do have a knack for picking stocks and bonds. But the problem is, is they're all competing with each other and they can't all be winners. It's just not possible. If one manager wins, that means another one has to lose. You know, Connor, I, I'm a big college basketball junkie. I certainly enjoyed watching the NCAA tournament here uh, over the over the weekend. But I kind of compare this to the NCAA tournament. And it, it'd be like, if, if you think about mutual fund managers, it'd be like if the NCAA tournament was filled with 64 teams, all as good as Kentucky. They're going to rip each other's faces off. They, they can't all win. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not all good. But again, somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And unfortunately for investors, when it comes to actively managed mutual funds, because these funds do tend to charge higher fees and because these managers are typically pretty good and they beat each other up, it actually ends up being the mutual fund investor who loses the majority of the time. And I think that's what we see in the SPIVA scorecard. Yeah, Nate, I mean, that was very well explained because you you have to look at this data objectively as an investor. And if you or your advisor are still using actively managed mutual funds, you need to take a hard look as to why and what the reasoning is and what the the thesis is to be able to attempt to pick the funds that are going to perform well or outperform. And, and the reality is many investors have already made this decision for themselves. Just look at the fund flows from 2014. And I know I mentioned this a few weeks back on the on the show, but it bears revisiting. In 2014, ETFs brought in over $241 billion in the U.S., shattering the previous annual record of $188 billion. Actively managed mutual funds, completely different story. They lost, lost, mind you, $100 billion in assets, $98.4 billion to be precise. I mean, that is just a massive discrepancy from the year that ETFs had. So at the end of the day, there's no more clear data in support of index products than investors voting with their hard-earned dollars. Yeah, and I think what the data tells us is that instead of focusing on active managers and trying to pick the right active managers, what you want to do is focus on the things you can control. Investment costs, taxes, the allocation in your portfolio. These are the things that are going to drive long-term uh, investment returns. And I think, to your point, that's why you are seeing investors flock to index-based uh, products like ETFs. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to shift gears and talk about an up-and-coming area of, an, of the uh, investment advice world. And you may have heard of these, something called robo-advisors. These are essentially online websites that allow you to set up an investment account, and then they'll automatically invest you in a portfolio. They'll rebalance that portfolio and typically do so at a very low cost. And we actually rolled out our own online investment service last week. It's called iPortfolios. So we'll offer some thoughts on robo-advisors, and we'll tell you uh, tell you why we decided to make the jump into this space. We'll do that right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. You want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? 
if you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers, then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next-generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode, so give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly live in studio this morning. We were talking before a break about the underperformance of actively managed mutual funds. And as it turns out, if you look at the majority of investment advisors out there, especially if you look at a lot of the bigger names, the fact is they typically use actively managed mutual funds in their client portfolios for a variety of reasons, many of which we've talked about on the show before. But Connor, you know, we're going to talk about robo-advisors here. And I actually think a combination of this mutual fund underperformance and then you add in the Great Recession and some other factors we'll talk about as well, this has caused a lot of investors, especially younger investors, to almost become disenfranchised with certain aspects of investing, including professional investment advice. And this combination of things has helped to give rise to something called robo-advisors. These are investment services where you're not interacting directly with a human investment advisor, but instead doing everything online. And these services, uh, they're generating quite a bit of buzz right now. I've seen articles in Time and USA Today, the Wall Street Journal. If you haven't heard of robo-advisors, uh, you certainly will. And we actually launched our own robo-advisory service last week. It's called iPortfolios. We'll tell you a little bit more about that here in a moment. But Connor, our industry, without question, is undergoing some significant changes right now. There's no doubt about that. And, we, you know, we spent the first part of the show talking about the shift from actively managed mutual funds to ETFs. And, and the analogies with the tech space have been common with the growth of ETFs. So we've had commentators, you know, that have called ETFs the next generation investment tool. Other commentators have compared ETFs to, to digital music or, or iTunes and actively managed mutual funds you know, have been compared to the outdated cassette tapes. Well, a similar technological advancement is also happening in the investment advice space with the explosion of so-called robo-advisors. And, Nate, you mentioned the Great Recession. And, again, like we talked about in the first segment, in combination with the mutual fund underperformance, this has caused investors to really start questioning the fees that they were paying for their investments and their advice. All of these factors led to the rapid growth of ETFs. Well, additionally, investors are also looking not only at the expenses they pay for their investments, but also taking a harder look at the cost of their investment advice, which has resulted in the recent uptick in robo-advisors. So let me explain the term first, as it's likely something you've heard of in the, in the financial news over the past year. Robo-advisors, generally speaking, are, are online, automated investment platforms offering professionally managed model portfolios, but without the individual human advisor. The typical process is completing a, a risk tolerance questionnaire, which helps the platform determine how aggressive or conservative your investment should be, and a model portfolio is recommended to you based on your answers to these questions. The advisory fees on these platforms are usually significantly lower than what you would find in a traditional advisory firm. And to the points you made earlier, um, with with the the renewed focus of fees from investors from all angles, 
not only what they're what they're owning, but how they're owning it and how they're getting their advice has has put a lot of recent um, uh, essentially excitement behind this robo advisory space. Yeah, there are several keys here with these robo advisors, and no question. I, I think first and foremost, as you mentioned, Connor, cost. Is certainly one of those uh, one of those factors. It's it's clearly one of the biggest factors. Most robo advisors are using low cost ETFs, and then the service itself, so the investment advice itself, is typically much cheaper than working with a human advisor. So so think about it like this: if you're using a human investment advisor and they charge, uh, let's say one percent each year, and then they're investing you in actively managed mutual funds that charge, let's say another one percent each year, well that's two percent each year that you're paying. Well, these robo-advisors are charging maybe a third of a percent or a half of a percent, and then they're using ETFs that cost a tenth of a percent. So if you add all that up, all in, you're maybe paying a half of a percent total instead of 2% total. That's a big difference. And then the other thing is that these services automatically invest your money. They automatically rebalance your portfolio. It's all automated and you have full visibility to everything online. It's computer programs doing the work behind the scenes. But in the, in the websites that you visit, that you interact with, these are all very intuitive. They're mm-hmm. easy to navigate. They look good. They're mobile compatible. And so right now, if you kind of add all these things together, it's really younger investors in particular who are giving these robo advisors a serious look? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. I think the, the the most important one is a lot of advisors with with traditional um, money management firms have somewhat significant minimums to to take on new clients. I mean, that could be anywhere from fifty thousand dollars to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And frankly, most young investors don't have those kind of assets to be able to work with an advisor at that level. But they still need the professional advice. Yes, exactly. So. You know, the the second part of that is millennials are much more comfortable with a web-based advisory solution instead of the personal interaction with an advisor. You you know, this generation has grown up online, um, social media. I mean, that is not a a hurdle to most younger investors to have a web-based solution. And finally, look, some investors, frankly, have a simple financial picture and don't require the specific and tailored investment advice and financial planning advice that comes with an individual advisor relationship. Yeah, so we're very excited about this here at the ETF store. As I mentioned, we did launch our own online investment service last week. It's called iPortfolios. You can find it at iPortfolios.com. And the reason we did this was primarily because we wanted to have a better way to service younger investors, uh, as well as investors who maybe just don't need or want a full-service investment advisor, but they do still want professionally managed portfolios. And through iPortfolios, we offer a lineup of our ETF store portfolios. These are comprised of low-cost ETFs. There's automatic rebalancing, and and everything is done online from account setup to tracking performance. And by the way, your account is set up at TD Ameritrade, one of the largest brokerages in the country. But you can set financial goals and track progress. You can set up monthly contributions. It's all there. Yeah, you know, it really is, Nate. And and the bottom line is with iPortfolios and why we're so excited about it is, is it be, brings us an additional platform to reach more investors and, and potentially investors that, that didn't have enough assets to feel like they could work with our firm um, on an individual advisor level. And it, and it still allows us, and this is important, to offer them the same low-cost, tax-efficient, professionally managed model portfolios that we provide for our individual advisor-based client book. Yeah. Now, a question you might be asking yourself, and I think this would be a good question, is should I just replace my human investment advisor with a robo-advisor? And of course, at the ETF store, we do have a full team of experienced human investment advisors. That's clearly a big part of what we do. But the way we view this is that there's a place for both. And ultimately, the answer to whether you should use a human advisor or robo-advisor is it depends. Because (laughs) Regardless of what an investment advisor may tell you, not everyone does need a full-service investment advisor. It's really going to depend on your situation. Yeah, it it absolutely comes down to your individual, unique situation. And there are a bunch of questions you can ask yourself rhetorically to maybe get to that answer because the robo-advisor is certainly not for everybody. Do you have considerable investment assets? Do you you require retirement planning or, or college forecasting analysis? Are you retired or about to retire? 
and need help determining the optimal strategy to withdraw your funds? Do you have other financial planning needs such as risk management products like life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance? Quite frankly, many investors still prefer to work with an advisor face-to-face and would never dream of utilizing a robo-advisor. But for younger clients, the online platform, the online-based platform, is not seen in a negative light. So again, it comes down to your particular situation and what you require out of your advisory service. Yeah, and I think what it boils down to, it, just listening to your questions there, Connor, is if you have a more complex financial situation, if you do need full retirement forecasting and financial planning and help with, with the sort of things that you pointed out, well, it probably is going to make more sense for you to deal face-to-face with an, an investment advisor who can offer all of those things. If perhaps your financial situation is not quite as complex, maybe uh, you don't have you know, a, an enormous investable uh, asset balance uh, to put into the markets, well, I think a robo-advisor can be a great fit. Yeah, absolutely. It it's, it's really comes down to, I think, complexity is the, the best word to, to help explain what option might be best for your situation because – the, the individual financial planning services and and, and forecasting and um, you know risk based t- uh, services college planning all of that is, is something that we offer our individual advisor clients. However, you know when you're on iPortfolios or another robo advisor solution, you are simply paying for the management of those funds and nothing else. And for some investors, that's all they need. Now, you know, something else that I think would be a, a good question to ask in determining whether to use a human advisor or, or a, a robo-advisor is how do you react to the financial markets? Because, you know, think about it like this. If the market suddenly tanks, are you prone to panic and sell everything, or, or do you maintain an even kill? Because a robo-advisor isn't going to stop you from moving your money out of stocks. And I actually think one of the biggest values a human investment advisor provides is that they can help guide you through both turbulent markets and good markets and make sure you're staying on course. You know, this might be the most important factor out of all of them in determining if a robo-advisor is a good potential fit for you as an investor because, Nate, you're exactly right. I mean, the emotions of investing, the behavioral finance side of, of our job, and one of the more most important roles I have as an advisor is to keep my clients from making emotional decisions, to, you know, quote-unquote, talk them back from the ledge when, when things get tough in the market, and if, if you have to be honest with yourself, if you're prone to pulling your money in and out of the market and making emotional decisions as an investor, then a robo-advisor likely isn't the best solution for you. Well, again, if you'd like to check out our online investment service, again, it's called iPortfolios. You can visit iPortfolios.com, and you can look at all of the tools for free just by entering an email address and password. You don't actually have to set up an investment account or fund an account. So if you just want to see how the service works and whether it's a good fit for you, you can do that for free. There's absolutely no obligation, and we promise not to send you a bunch of marketing emails uh, either. So, again, that website is iPortfolios.com. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at ETFstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. When refinancing a mortgage, all of the numbers can become confusing. With First Mortgage Solutions, you only need to remember two, 500, and zero. $500 is the amount our average customer saves every month after refinancing. And zero is the number of loans we've ever done that have ended up in default. At First Mortgage Solutions, business is based on dollars and cents. Saving you dollars with loans that make sense. 
For more information, call 816-778-7000 or apply online at firstmortgagekc.com. NMLS number 244476. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products and categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. Go with Regal, distributing service and solutions since 1955. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor live in studio this morning. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A big week for just about every major asset class last week. The Spider S&P 500 ETF was up two and a quarter percent. The Vanguard Developed Markets ETF was up over 4%, and the Schwab Emerging Markets Equity ETF was up 3 and 2 thirds percent for the week. Looking at bonds, the iShare 7 to 10 year Treasury Bond ETF was up 1 and 2 thirds percent. And then finally, looking at some alternative investments, the iShares Gold Trust was up nearly 2.5%. The Rogers International Commodity ETN was up 1 and a third percent. And the Vanguard REIT ETF was up five and two thirds percent for the week. And it's interesting, the market was sort of treading water the first part of last week. And then what happened was that on Wednesday, the Fed released their policy statement. And everyone in the markets was watching to see if they would remove the word patient from the statement. In previous statements, the Fed had said that they would remain patient in raising interest rates. Well, interestingly, they did remove this word patient from the statement which does open the door up for uh, for interest rate increases. But they also made it clear that economic growth and the labor market still aren't where they want them to be and inflation isn't where they want it to be. And so the long story short is that the markets interpreted this statement as dovish overall, which was bullish for stocks and other investments last week. Yeah, we covered this quite a bit last week, actually, Nate, in terms of when the Fed could and would possibly raise rates. And the statement was bullish for the markets because most viewed it is leaving the door open to, to pushing the rate hike later in the year. And last week we also discussed how a strong dollar is making it more difficult for the Fed to raise rates because not only is a strong dollar deflationary, so is the drop in energy prices, specifically oil, over the past six months. So the, the Fed has to be concerned about continued strengthening of a dollar, and a rate increase would actually result in a even stronger dollar, which which is something that certainly has the Fed's attention. And, and in fact, their, their, their statement from last week actually referenced this precise concern, that the strong dollar was something that, that has their attention, and, and the assumption is that they will consider how any move they might make would impact the dollar strength going forward. You know, there are a lot of variables here, but again, what it comes back down to is from from the financial market perspective, if interest rates remain where they're at, you know, for the time being, that's bullish. That's supportive of, of stocks and, and a number of other investments. Uh, but, you know, once the Fed starts raising rates, uh, you know, the question is, how will the financial markets respond at that point? And so you can just feel with every Fed statement that comes out that they're just walking this tightrope. Uh, you know, they're trying to say and do the right things. I think that's evidenced by the fact that you have the market looking at one word one word in the statement and whether or not it's still there but but the funny thing was is that they removed that word that everybody was looking at but then they tempered that by adding some more dovish comments so you know what i take from that is let's not underestimate the players at the fed 
Okay, these are some very smart individuals. They know exactly what they're doing, and they parse every word in the statement to make sure that it's presented in the in the right manner. And you know, their job, if you think about it, is they need to have a clean exit from from the policies that they've undertaken here over the last few years. And so they do have to pay attention to to the words that they have in the statement, what they take out, how they how they frame it. And so it's just going to be interesting to watch. But you know, the market last week obviously did react very favorably to that because the thought was that instead of a potential interest rate increase in June, that that's now been pushed out to, you know, perhaps September at the earliest. And, and Connor, to your point, you know, we talked a lot about this last week, that you have a lot of, uh, of, of savvy market players trying to determine when the rate increase is going to happen. And, you know, if you go back all the way to the begin, end of 2013, beginning of 2014, you had a lot of prognosticators uh, saying, well, we're going to have a rate increase at the end of you know, later in 2014, mm-hmm. and then they got moved to early 2015. Then it got moved to June of 2015. Now it's push out to September. And what we were talking about last week, you know, are we going to even get an interest rate increase this year? Well, I apologize to our listeners if they feel like they're experiencing deja vu because <laughs> I feel like I am because every we're week talking about this every week and. Both the stock and bond market performance right now is almost solely dependent on the action of central banks as opposed to other stuff, Nate. You know, for instance, like economic growth, (laughs) jobs, and the earnings of individual companies, which is normally the driver of market performance. But we're in this unique, frankly, uncharted territory where central banks and their actions are are driving the majority of the performance um, of markets, not only in the U.S., but globally. I mean, that, that's been one of the big reasons for the huge outperformance um, from Europe and Japan here to date is, is the very stimulative, accommodative measures that their central banks are taking. So, again, we, we keep talking about um, the actions of the Fed as well as ECB and BOJ on our in our market updates, but... We, we can't not talk about them because they are driving so much of what is occurring in the global markets. And from an investor's perspective, this certainly can be a little nerve-wracking. I, I saw a comment this morning on CNBC uh, where, where the gentleman was stating that we could have some severe dislocations in the market once the Fed does start raising interest rates. And, you know, you hear stuff like that as an investor, and it can be a little unnerving. You know, what this comes back down to – it's diversification. You you have to have a plan in place, and you have to have a diversified portfolio. And and I always use the example. We talked a lot about this at the beginning of the year. Go back to 2014 and look at bonds. You, you know, everybody was predicting this interest rate increase mm-hmm. never came to fruition. And look what had one of the best performing uh, years. It, it was longer duration bonds. But you know, my point is, is we sit here today. Nobody knows exactly how this is going to play out, even the Fed. And even though they are extremely smart and talented, as I mentioned earlier, they don't know exactly what's going to happen once they they start raising interest rates. And so as an investor, the key here is you do want to have a plan and you want to stay diversified. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. If you've loaded up on on U.S. stocks, certainly they've had a tremendous run. Well, you know, make sure you've rebalanced down to where that allocation should be for your situation. You know, you should have some, some exposure to international stocks. We've talked about what we've seen out of European mm-hmm. stocks so far this year. You know, you look at real estate. I mean, REITs, you know, up almost 6% last week. Now, if you get an interest rate increase, perhaps, you know, you have a pullback there. But the point is, is you want to spread your bets. Well, you want to spread your bets and also take a longer-term approach because there's no doubt when rates do finally rise in the short term, it's going to cause some pain for fixed income holdings and other high-yielding investments like REITs. But you have to take a longer-term approach because, in reality, the the Fed raising rates is a long-term, more bullish view on the U.S. economy because they're saying we don't need these uh, extreme, extremely accommodative, stimulative measures of, of 0% short-term rates, and, and you have to take a longer-term view and not overreact to any short-term gyrations in the market when the Fed finally does raise their rates. Yeah, and unfortunately, even though I know it doesn't make for the uh, most entertaining radio, I have a bad feeling we'll be talking about the Fed uh, just about every week on the show. So hopefully we can uh, we can liven it up a little bit. That's a good bet, Nate. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll spotlight an ETF holding 3,800 stocks and only costing 0.05%. That's 0.05%. We'll tell you what that is after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510.
Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapist, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at MyMassageBliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International. 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget-friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without giving up dependability, let us be your personal shipping assistant. Call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life, architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has their weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at etfstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci alongside Connor Kelly in studio this morning. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF. The ticker on that is VTI. And this ETF holds the stocks of about 3,800 U.S. companies. And I would offer that if you're looking for broad-based exposure to the U.S. stock market, you're really going to be hard-pressed to find a better fund than this. And one of the main reasons for that is that this ETF only costs 0.05%. So to put that into context, and we mentioned this earlier in the show, the average actively managed U.S. stock mutual fund costs 1.3% each year. In other words, this ETF is more than 25 times less expensive than the average active stock mutual fund. Now, just because it has this low price doesn't mean low quality. As a matter of fact, according to Morningstar, over the past 10 years, 
This ETF has beaten the S&P 500 by 0.4% a year and has outperformed two-thirds of large blend mutual funds. So this ETF could certainly make for an excellent core holding in a, in a portfolio. It includes large, mid, and small cap U.S. stocks. It effectively covers the entire U.S. stock market. Connor, this is a tough ETF to beat. I tell you what, if you're looking for a one-stop shop for U.S. stock market exposure, this would probably be it. To your point, it has large, mid, and small cap exposure in the rough uh, proportion to, to how, how much this market, our U.S. stock market, is broken down between those asset classes. And, and you know, Nate, we, we spent the first segment of the show talking about the, the SPIVA scorecard and the underperformance of actively managed mutual funds. And let me repeat what you just said. This fund beat two-thirds of the large-cap U.S. stock mutual funds over the past 10 years, and with an annual expense of 0.05%. Let me put that a different way. For every ten thousand dollars you invest in this fund, it costs you five bucks a year. Compare that to what you said the average was for actively managed mutual funds, one point three percent. That's a hundred and thirty dollars a year compared to five bucks per year for this for this fund. That is a that is a pretty small hurdle to overcome in, in each year in fees compared to again the one to one point three percent most actively managed mutual funds need to try to overcome each year. And again, for that fee, you're getting exposure to basically the entire U.S. stock market. But you bring up a good point. I want to come back to this this issue of fees because when we were talking about actively managed mutual funds earlier in the show, you know, we talked about how, look, there are some very smart mutual fund managers. They are very talented, and they do have an ability to pick uh, stocks. But the issue is this fee. And so you look at a situation uh, of the av- average actively managed mutual fund at 1.3%, and then you look at an ETF like this at 0.05%. So you have a 1.25% difference. So, again, you have to think of that as the mutual fund is starting in that 1.25% hole just to get to, to where the ETF is at. That's right. That That is not easy to overcome on, no, on any given year. It's not. And when you look at the, the, the percent um, that most actively managed mutual funds um, miss their benchmark, you know, on average, it usually comes out to being, you know, slightly more than what their average expenses are. So, I mean, these, these again, these managers are, are very bright, but the hurdles they face with redemptions and having to sell uh, positions when they don't want to sell it, and it, it, as well as obviously the high fees and a lot of other things that we've jumped into on, on other shows, but they have a lot of barriers in front of them that they need to hurdle every year just to get back to where the ETF is starting out the year. And I don't want to belabor the point here on fees, but you know if you think about this particular uh, ETF and just think of U.S. stocks in general, again, very efficient market. I think we would all agree the data bears it out that it's very tough to outperform that market. And so if you are paying these extra fees every year, you know, as an investor, if you start compounding, even if it's a half of a percent, mm-hmm. year after year after year, that becomes a pretty big number, and and so you have to pay attention to to fees like this. And you know, I think Connor, we talked in the in the second segment about uh, robo advisors, and we mentioned uh, our i portfolios offering. And as it turns out, this particular ETF uh, is one that we offer on i portfolios. And the reason we do is because of the cost, primarily that we can get this this broad base exposure to the U.S. stock market, cover large, mid, and small cap U.S. stocks, and do so. For five basis points. Yeah, it, it provides great, inexpensive, tax-efficient exposure and very closely tracks its benchmark. And added to that, VTI is on the commission-free trade list at good, TD good Ameritrade. So there's no cost to even buy into this ETF, even if you're only talking about starting out as a new investor and only having a couple hundred dollars. You're not even having to pay the eight ninety five to get into it. So it is... All in cost to, to own and buy and sell this ETF is five basis points per year. I mean, it is simply outstanding. We, we mentioned how primarily younger investors are gravitating to the robo advisors. And again, you think of an ETF like this, there's no minimum to invest in it. And so, you know, if you have a smaller account balance, and again, I think this ETF could be a wonderful holding for, for any type of yes. investor, but especially for a small investor, if you have a smaller account balance, to very easily be able to get exposure to the entire U.S. stock market, it's just it's very compelling. It, it's a it's a core building block for uh, many investors. To your point, Nate, but obviously new investors, it's a no brainer because it gives you 
exposure to the entire U.S. equity market, no trading commissions on TDA and, and other platforms for this particular ETF. So again, even if you're starting out with just a couple hundred bucks a month or a few thousand dollars, this ETF can be an outstanding building block for your portfolio. So again, that's the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF, ticker VTI. We'll have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store show are available at ETFstore.com and also Apple iTunes. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And you can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Thanks again for joining us this morning. And be sure to tune in next Tuesday at 9 a.m. We'll be joined by Marie DeZanis. She's head of ETF sales and servicing at FlexShares. FlexShares is a very interesting ETF provider. We've had a Marie on the show before. They use what's called a flexible indexing approach in their ETF. So we'll talk to Marie about that. And we'll also look under the hood of a few FlexShares ETFs. Until then, have a great week, everyone.